Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Where can you turn if you think you've been abducted by aliens? Does hypnotism render reliable results? What is the disclosure movement? Greetings and welcome to the 855th edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. I am Ben, and those specie questions came from my co-host, partner in Paranormal Adventures, and Dad, Paul. And today, we bring you a guest who was last with us eh, around 11 years ago. Uh, and we welcome your calls today. The number is 401-766-1240. That is from anywhere. Or you can email paul at behindtheparanormal.com or contact us via Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram for those of us that are a little too uh, phone shy, I suppose. Okay. Nadine Lalich began, uh, coming to us via Skype today, I should say, Nadine Lalich uh, began UFO studies in 2004 to investigate her own traumatic abduction experience that occurred on June 15, 1991. A retired paralegal, Nadine has also researched areas related to psychology and spiritual development. She is the author of Evolution, Coming to Terms with the ET Presence, and Alien Experiences, 25 Cases of Close Encounter before, Never Before Revealed co-authored by psychotherapist Barbara Lamb. She has also written a children's book, Finding Happiness, A Magical Tale About the Power of Positive Thinking. I think everybody should read that today, not just kids. Yeah, right. (laughs) Nadine appeared in the New Paradigm Films documentary The Day Before Disclosure, Discovery Channel's Best Evidence, Alien Abduction, and Discovery Health Channel's Alternatives to Healing. She has been a guest on numerous radio shows, a featured speaker for MUFON Chapters, uh, the Los Angeles Paranormal Society and UFO Con. Her articles appear regularly in JAR Magazine Journal of Abduction Research. Her website, alienexperiences.com. So, Nadine Lalich, welcome back to Behind the Paranormal. Well, thank you so much. I'm happy to be here again. Oh, it's great to have you with us. So I guess we'll uh, we'll you know we we don't pull any punches here. We hop straight into the into the meat and potatoes. So the origins of you your UFO research were on a camping trip in a remote forest in Arizona. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience? Or or a lot about it. Actually. Or a lot about it. You know, twenty five <laughs> words or less. <laughs> well, um, I'll try to encapsulate it here. Um, traveled from California with a friend. We were going to do some hiking in um, the Sedona Vortexes. And we stopped about 20 miles north of Sedona. It was late at night, about 10 o'clock. And uh, we decided we would pull over into a um, day picnic area. So we did just that. It was a very remote area. We were coming down through the switchbacks. There was no one else in the park. Uh, It was probably a dozen uh, parking spots all that was there was very rustic. There was no electricity. All that was there was, um, I think there was some water. There was an outhouse. There was a picnic table with a place to build a fire at each one of these little uh, parking areas. Went to sleep, and uh, what we had done, but prior to that, is we took everything out of the van. We put it all outside on the picnic table. We laid sleeping bags down in the back. Went to sleep probably around uh, 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. And um, about an hour, hour and a half later, I woke to sounds outside the van. I was concerned because we're two women alone in this remote area. So I sat up and I was straining to listen. And um, I thought it was just footsteps, people walking around the van. Um, After setting up for a minute or two, the back door opened up. Now, all the doors had been locked, certainly. Uh, The back door of the van swung open. The lights came on, blinded my eyes. And my first recollection of what I see is a hand coming towards me with three fingers and a thumb, gray, pasty white. I got such a good, close look at it. Um, I'd already been sitting up. I was wide awake. I could even see little indentations in the tips of the fingers. And that was my first conscious, fully awake introduction to the phenomenon of alien abduction. Ben, you have another question here? I Uh, do. Um, So your experiences continued for years, and this led to the involve. This led to be, you know, involved by the military. How how did that kind of get 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 going? Well, um, that came in later after I started talking publicly. Uh, 
it was somewhere around um, 2010, and um, I woke one night in my room, and there was someone in the room. My dog Annie was awake, and she was uh, whining, and there was someone standing in my room. Um, now, I think what happened here is that after the initial experience in 91, I sat on this for a long time, and I used journaling, because writing is my, my favorite thing to do, and I used journaling. So I had dozens and dozens of journals over the years, because it became very prolific through different periods of my life. I came in t- 2004, I'd sort of had enough, decided to investigate, um, and met Barbara Lamb. Uh, we did some work together, produced a book, then probably around well, 2007, 2008, I started Uh, speaking in public. Now, until that time, I was not aware of anything related to military. What I think happened is that, and I think it may happen to a number of um, contactees, abductees, whatever term you want to use, um, I think I drew attention to myself speaking at the public level. So it was around 09, 2010, when I had this first experience of waking up And let me point out that it's very, very different. When you have these uh, paranormal ET contacts, as opposed to dealing with what appears to be military, it's totally, completely different. The way they take you, the procedures, everything's very, very different. On this first occasion, uh, someone was in my room. I could not get up off the bed. I was able to raise my head. I saw someone standing in the shadows. I saw someone outside the hallway. I always sleep with my doors locked, my bedroom door locked. The hallway light was on and there was someone else standing in the hallway and I could hear them whispering. That's a very big difference right there because what you're talking about with um, when it appears that human military are involved, everything is audio. There's no, um, there's no telepathy. There's no strange lights or going through walls. You literally get taken, walked out, put onto a helicopter. So it's a very different dynamic. But I think, and ultimately, I think I just drew attention to myself by speaking so much in public. Mm. Now, I believe you were regressed by hip, by a, a, a hypnotherapist. Is that correct? Yes. Um, what happened is that, you know, and, and there is a debate about whether or not, and I think you mentioned at the beginning of this, the big question is, you know, what is more valid? Is a conscious recollection more valid or is a hypnotic regression more valid? In my particular opinion, I think they're both valid. I think you use whatever tools you have available to try to discern this this very bizarre uh, arena. So most of my memories, the vast majority, and there's, a tremendous amount of material. That's why I just finally had to do this second book. Um, most of it's conscious, 95, 96% conscious. I did, on a number of occasions, maybe six different times, six or seven times, I did regressions um, uh, to several of the events. I've most of, uh, maybe most of those were with Barbara Lamb. I did one with. Um, uh, another gal, and um, nothing contradicted, which I found was interesting, because I think think when it came to hypnosis, now, the human mind is such a, you know, it's such a tenuous area, because, you know, there's so many factors come into play the way we record memory, and I've always been fascinated with the brain, how we store information, I'm interested in accelerated learning, Um, and so, you know, you you cannot look at any of this, in my opinion, from my experience and research, is that you can't look at it as 100%. This is an experience that takes place in the gray, and I think the word paranormal is very very astute at describing that. So I did have some, and the one thing I can say is it didn't conjure up anything that was out of the ordinary from my conscious memory. What it did do is um, it enhanced, it filled in some places. For example, the first experience... Um, when we were in that camping area, is I had some pieces. I remember standing at the back of the van. I remember moving through the woods. Uh, Very clear recollections, but then there were some blank places. Uh, That is one of the times years later that we did indeed, uh, Barbara Lamb and I did a regression on that one. I also did one with a gal um, in Santa Fe, New Mexico, 
and it appeared that I had been on a craft, and it, it included that examination. But nothing contradicted um, my conscious memories when I have done those regressions. Do you remember how you felt when aboard the craft? Uh, was there any communication with the occupants, and did you learn anything about them? Well, there's a lot of communication that transpires, but um, I have had very few instances, a lot of experiences over decades, but I've had very few experiences where um, it's an ongoing interaction. You might get some response, a little bit of a response, often no response. Of course, when you're dealing with the phenomenon of ET uh, contact, you're dealing always with telepathy. You're not dealing with any kind of vocal communication. Um, so my always initially, for many, many years, for most of the experience, there's tremendous fear when it begins. And it begins in different ways. It's not always a physical abduction. Those are in the smaller percentage. Some of the others appear to be an astral ex experience. Some involve uh, lucid dreaming. So there's different ways that these uh, contacts happen. Generally, the physical ones, there's a lot of fear initially, a lot of adrenaline, and then um, afterwards, as it's ongoing, they, yeah, they always have some means of subduing you, subduing your emotions. Um, being on what appeared to be a craft has happened a number of times to me. I've observed uh, different species. I've observed um, different kinds of technology that they put in front of me that that appeared to be for um, training, testing. I've seen um, different methods that looked like they were actually controlling the craft, ways that they control the craft. I've seen um, on being transferred from a helicopter onto a craft, I've seen um, apparently ETs and what looked like human military on a craft like that, a UFO craft working together. So I've observed a lot. During the course of your life, whether before or after the initial abduction experience in 1991, have you had other paranormal experiences that might seem unrelated to the alien scenario? Uh, ghosts, uh, cryptids, um, the th things of that kind. The I whole mean, gambit. The, the whole thing. Yes. Okay. Absolutely. That's our special area of study. Yes. We think they all yes. are related. Yes, I agree with you. So pl please um, tell us about that, if you could. Well, all right. For example, um, when I was growing up, now if we go, if we look at everything is connected. That's my belief system. Ours I don't too. think I think we're all connected. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Everything is connected. These experiences have some thread that brings them all together. So, um, and if I was to do another book, I would do it leaning towards the paranormal aspect, honestly. Um, so. If we look at when I was a child growing up, there were a lot of strange things that happened in the house. For example, um, and I would say this happened in the early years, maybe the first uh, 10, 12 years of my life. We lived in a small town in, in Michigan, southern Michigan, and um, we saw an apparition in the house. It was a regular thing that we saw. Now, there was just four of us in the family. I had an older brother, five years older. But we, this apparition was something you saw with your eyes. This was not something that, it was imaginary. This is always in a fully waking condition. And what would happen is that you'd be in a room and you would have a sensation that you were being watched. And you would turn and there would this thing be. And it would be, the, the way that it looked is it looked like it would be perhaps three feet tall, 24 inches, 30 inches wide. Imagine it as a cloud almost, fairly thick-looking cloud. And it, you felt something intelligent staring at you. You would turn and you would look at it, and it would stay motionless, just hovering in the air like that. And then it would move. And when it moved, it dissipated very quickly. It moved very fast, and as it moved, it would dissipate into nothing and be gone. Now, I saw that alone on numerous occasions. My brother saw it. My brother and I saw it together. The whole family saw it together. Um, my mother and I were in a room once. She was vacuuming in my bedroom behind me, and she turned the vacuum off. And, um, you know, it was some strange stuff. And 
she said, what is that behind you? And I turned, and there it is, behind me. We also had uh, a strange um, audio kinds of phenomena take place in the house. Um, lights in the house, some strange lights, um, some very strange lights um, that almost could be akin to some of the things you see described in ET abductions where they see the lights outside. And I've had a number of experiences that I related more to the ET phenomenon where there was a an, like an explosion outside of my window. I had one occasion, and this would have been, I was living in Laguna Woods, California, and this would have been maybe 2008, something like that, brushing my teeth, getting ready to go to bed, and there's a big flash of light outside my bedroom window. Then I, I'm startled by it. I'm standing up, toothbrush in hand, and it comes into the window. And it kind of explodes right in front of me into a shaft of light that goes kind of upward to the ceiling and has little blue sparkles in it. And my reaction was very bizarre. I, I, I had a dog at the time, Murphy, and he was sitting on the bed. And uh, <laughs> I just jumped in the bed and pulled covers over my head. Very strange reaction. But that was kind of similar to some of the things that we saw um, growing yeah. up. Yeah. Interesting. I, I always think it's 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 sort of it, the same thing happens in, in sort of the, the, the general paranormal um, field where everyone kind of hyper focuses on the phenomena itself, but not so much the experiencer. Now, I think that's changing over, over, over time, slowly but surely. But I think really um, one of the things that I find most fascinating is sort of the psychological effects afterwards. Right? How does mm. how does one adjust to daily life after you know you you're abducted or you deal with this daily? Now now how how have you sort of adjusted? How has this affected you? Well, this is many years later. Obviously, I've had many years to process this, mm. and uh, two books out. I've gone through everything in great great detail that it, that I've personally experienced. Um, I also early on I I made a point. In the early years of exploring this phenomenon, I made a point of making sure all of my diaries had been transcribed, all of my memories, all of the drawings, before I perused any other information from other experiences. I didn't want to tarnish my own personal experience. But in answer to your question, how did it affect me? Um, I think in some ways I found the paranormal a little easier. Then I did the ET. We back to the paranormal for a moment. I got it. We got a Ouija board, and um, I'm sure you're very familiar with that. And mm-hmm. there's a lot of negative connotation about that. I got a Ouija board when I was 16 for Christmas. My brother was going to leave, and he was going to Vietnam. He had been drafted, and it was so. This would have been December of um, oh my goodness, December of 67. We got the Ouija board, we took it out, and we began to play with the Ouija board. I had no prior experience with it, but the Ouija board was very strange. Now, we were all a little on edge because Frankie was going off to the Vietnam War. He was leaving in a couple of days. And um, the board went crazy. And the board kept... We had great difficulty playing with this board, and the board, you know, it's a very interesting experience, a Ouija board, and you know you're not pushing this thing. It's picking the vibrations from the people whose hands are on it, and it does its own thing, and um, it kept spelling out, remove the pin, remove the pin, and if you know how a Ouija board has a little plastic center, and then it has a little copper or silver pin in the center, and it kept saying, move the pin, and... Um, uh, why remove the pin? It said because it meant death to my brother. Bury the pin in the yard. It means death to my brother. Well, it was pretty spooky. We didn't like it. We were very uncomfortable. But my brother did go to Vietnam, and he was critically wounded. He did not die. But he was indeed um, 100% disabled with head injuries and body injuries. Um, so... I think the paranormal in general was easier for me to process. The other was more, uh, when it came to the ET, actual contact. Um, that expands your world view in a different way. I think paranormal for me is more akin to a spiritual awakening, um, interdimensional kind of thing. 
But with the ET phenomenon, what happened, of course, is is you're kind of being victimized because nobody asked you. And um, so that was a harder, much more difficult physical reality in my now. And that took years to process before I could even come out and start to talk about it. Uh, I was uh, very apprehensive. Now, of course, I've spent so many years at this state of, stage of my life exploring so many things. I don't have a lot of fear of much of anything anymore, though, yeah. actually. <laughs> Yeah, I think you and I are roughly the same vintage, and uh, yes. I have to agree. Uh, now, Nadine, um, I, I want to get into consciousness and spirituality uh, as, as we go and its relationship to all this, but we have a question from a listener. We have a very faithful listener in Bogota, Colombia, who always sends in excellent questions, and he has several for you. Oh, yes. Uh, Peter writes to us. Uh, the first question of the three uh, please ask Nadine, what names uh, do aliens use for themselves? Greys, Nordics are our expressions, but what do they use? Well, in my experience, I've never never heard, seen, experienced telepathy where they mentioned um, their own uh, a description of themselves. I've never seen anything like that. The only time that I ever got a name was when I was presented with an alleged a hybrid daughter who was looked to be about 22 years old. This happened on the, what looked like a craft, and um, she was presented to me. And that is the only time a name was ever presented to me to identify any kind of um, non-human being entity, and it was Chutka. Take it for what you will. Sounds into it. Almost. Yeah, that was it. Yeah. That was, yeah. But otherwise, no, nobody refalled, referred to their species. I've never seen anything like well, that. We tend to anthropomorphize anything. all these things. In the yeah. We do. You know. We do. It's true. Well, go ahead, Ben. Number so, two. So, Peter's second question is, uh, what exactly is the design of the military insignia seen in MI labs, and is there a name to go with it? Uh, yes. Now, that was a... That was uh, certainly an area that I researched because in um, several experiences it was very clear to me the insignia and the uniforms. I did research them and I did indeed break them down into two different departments within the U.S. government, within the military complex. But um, I choose not to um, share that to discuss those departments, um, I'm a, <laughs> I want to pose a very non-threatening stance. I, I, I don't care to go into that. For, quite frankly, I'd be, at this stage of my life, I, I don't want any kind of issues or problems. I'm more um, concerned with the way humans deal with this than I am extraterrestrials. So, yes, indeed, I was able to identify two very distinct departments. And I was able to very clearly uh, identify the patches and the uniforms, but I keep that private. Okay, it's probably very sensible. Uh, yeah. Well, we can take our break a little early, huh? Oh, sure thing. Okay, before we get to question number three. All right, we're going to take our break. Uh, it is Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno on WON 1240 AM and 99.5 FM in New England's beautiful Blackstone River Valley with our amazing guest today, Nadine Lalich. We will be right back, so stick with us. The night is alive. Join us and take a walk on the weird side when you tune in to The Kingdom of Nye, hosted by Heather Wade, the finest in late night talk. Listen live free weeknights starting at 9 p.m. Pacific time at thekingdomofnye.com, talkstreamlive.com, and the Paranormal Radio app. Want to take a ride? Local and live at 99.5 FM. And welcome back to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. It's WON 1240 AM and 99.5 FM. And uh, our, we're having a great discussion today with Nadine Lalich, uh, first time back on the show in 11 years. And uh, Nadine, we have a third question from Peter in Bogota, Colombia. Yes, and Peter writes to us, What part of abductions is still a mystery to you personally, or do you have all the answers? Oh, God. <laughs> a little loaded question. A little I've never heard of it. <laughs> I'm 
sorry. <laughs> no, I don't have all the answers. I don't ever think we will have all the answers. I mean, we are indeed dealing with advanced, uh, everything from advanced consciousness, expanded consciousness, uh, advanced uh, technology. Um, I think, first of all, let me say, I don't think I need to know it all. I don't think I have to have an answer per se. I don't think that's really possible in our current state of evolution, the, the human species. Uh, it's very difficult to comprehend things that are so far beyond the human experience. But what I do think is I think I, I kind of live my life in the gray and I continue to revise a hypothesis of what I believe may be going on. Um, it does nothing has to be set in stone or concrete. If you do that, when you lock in, you lock out. And I don't want to do that. I stay free flowing. I keep continue to research, bring new information in. And as we were talking about earlier, um, interweaving the paranormal in with this. Yes, it's all valid, it's all important and worthy of investigation. So it's an exciting position to be where you flow with something you stay open to new information you continue to build this hypothesis now you could ask me now you know what is my stand on something today where will it be in five years where was it five years ago very different because and because that's how we are as humans we're continually um, evolving on all these different levels and if you're really engrossed in study and um, and I love reading I love study I have a wide variety of, of subjects that I pursue um, and it's a very uh, flowing alive way of approaching this amazing place where we are you know um, multifaceted multidimensional so nothing's black and white for me I'm all right living not knowing everything. I don't want to know everything. It's not necessary. It's it's impossible. You know, we're all connected to this amazing universal energy that is intelligent and uh, promoted by love and creativity. So I just show up on a daily basis, keep reading, studying, take other people's information in, experiences, and work with my own personal uh, evolution of, of life, of what it means. Yeah, I like that. Now, let's get a little deeper here, Nadine, because uh, you, you're good at that. The idea that nothing is what it appears to be is one of our mottos, you know, and uh, particularly when it comes to the paranormal. Everybody assumes that if the ET thing is, uh, you know, the UFO thing in general is, uh, you know, nuts and bolts craft from other planets, which is entirely plausible. Uh, the method of travel may be quantum or multiversal, or anything, but still they could be craft from other planets. There's another opinion that these uh, could be time travelers, you know, whatever that means in a world where everything's, you know, the past and future are simultaneous, at least according to relativity and some of the physicists. So what are we actually, and, and that there are opinions too, and I think you, this has to be considered, uh, and it's mainly among sort of religious evangelicals or fundamentalists, whatever, that these are quote unquote demons, all right, just sort of messing with us. And from a certain point of view, uh, we deal with parasites, which I think that would create the demons of what, what folklore would call demons. And the parasitical entities, you know, are very good at mimicking as, as part of nature. There are mimics, uh, in order to find their prey and to pretend to be something else. So I think these, these are all things that ought to be considered. In your experience with this, what do you think we are actually dealing with, or does it vary? Is it all of the above, or some of the above? And what say you? Uh, with regard to the ET phenomenon, I do believe some uh, are actually physical. They're off-planet intelligent entities that come to our planet. I do believe some have actual physical crafts. Some. At the same time, I also believe that we're dealing with an. In, uh, we also oftentimes are dealing with interdimensional species, vibrating on a different plane, a different energy, that can manifest themselves here. Like we talk about Sasquatch sometimes, and a lot of people believe that they are interdimensional; like they can appear and disappear. Um, so I think that that that's certainly a second 
a real viable possibility. And one of my experiences was interesting because um, they told me, uh, apparent ETs told me in one instance that they did both. They used physical craft and they had a way to step into a different dimension and actually stop time. And then they could step in here. So th- other dimensions may indeed be a, a doorway here. So I think, I, again, I don't think it's black and white, either or. I think some of it is truly um, a physical phenomenon taking place. I mean, let's face it, there's enough information with everything from uh, radar to ground, you know, uh, surface being contaminated by radiation. There's all kinds of physical stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and also when you're dealing with the human body, you know, if you have experienced contact with physical, that look like they're physical, um, you have marks on your body. I've got some scoop marks and triangle pin marks and different uh, uh, marks on my body that have happened that are very bizarre. Now, the third thing is, is that we live in this huge consciousness, um, which which offers so many different possibilities. And you talk about demons. Now, I don't focus a lot on negativity, all right? One of the things in experiencing the ET phenomenon, and well, even in early on experiencing, I was very involved in metaphysics when I was young, and I wanted to explore, you know, the Ouija board thing, what was happening in other dimensions. That came on very early in my life when I was in my late teens. I was interested in that. And, um, but there is a way, you know, when you emanate an energy, a genuine energy of goodwill, something positive, emanate with love, you do offer a certain measure of protection to yourself. You know, a lot of people look at these things and they say demons because they're into religion. Well, you know, I'm, in many ways, you could call me a Christian. I had to learn how to integrate my faith. Now, I wasn't raised in a traditional faith, but I follow certain teachers, like Jesus Christ, the Buddha, and and the very important teachers and figures in my life. Um, when it comes to the demons, I think that um, I look at it more as negative energy. Mm, yeah. Okay? The demons are negative energy, and the human interprets it that's going through it, connecting with that energy the way that you will, mm-hmm. the way they're going to interpret it. Um, do I believe in demons? I don't interpret it that way. I don't, I mean, that's not to disrespect anybody else's view. Mm -hmm. I don't look at it that way. I see it as negative energy. Everything breaks down to energy for me. I protect myself in my life the way that I I interact with things by trying to project a core love and goodness and respect. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that makes all the difference in the world with what you attract. So in answer to your question, it could be a lot of many things. Yes, I believe some of the contact is with, is with actual physical beings. Yes, I believe that there are interdimensional connections taking place where some of our contacts with intelligence are actually coming through other dimensions. And the other thing is some of it's just energy that manifests and is attracted to certain people, and we interpret it the way we do. Yeah, no, no, I certainly think that's very well put, personally. Uh, we, we talk about the... Uh, Peter Pan theory. Uh, think happy thoughts. In, in other words, positive, respectful, all all the positive things that, that cut off the food supply for these theoretical, well, I don't think exactly. they're theoretical, these parasites, and that cut off the negative. Keep it positive. Come together with your well, family. Well, energy, you're family. right, because, you know, like energy attracts. Yeah. It attracts. Mm. So depending where your your mindset is at, the thoughts that you think uh, creates an actual vibration within your body, within, you know, within how you pull and attract. So I believe a lot of the people um, that attract what they interpret as negative um, entities or demons, I believe a lot of that is because at that particular moment in their life, what they're going through, they're generating something within themselves that makes that attractive, and you bring another energy in. And then you interpret it the way you want to interpret it. If you've got training, I think, you know, both of my parents were Catholics, but they did they they had some challenging uh, experiences with that, both of them, 
but they both grew up during the you know during the depression times mm. were tough and um so i didn't have any formal training i went seeking on my own i went to by the time i was 6 years old i was going with neighbors going to churches what was this thing people talked about and um so uh i didn't have any preconceived ideas put into me which was wonderful so i had an opportunity to interpret things in my own way and my own pace that actually brings up a really interesting point and i i you mentioned this a little earlier um which was sort of you didn't want to tarnish your experience um sort of by getting getting anything else to kind of color your your world view and they, and a lot of a lot of our theories are are sort of examining perspective and how how we perceive the experiences in front of us and you made a very interesting distinction between the sort of perceptions of para, anything paranormal versus that of ET whereas you know spirit, spiritual sort of um, enlightenment, I, I guess, for, for lack of better words, reg- in regards to paranormal, in victimization, in regards to ET. Now, that's not always the case, I understand. Um, but in in this sort of instance, where does this sort of shift in perspective come from? How how do we know how to discern between you know what's victimization and what's spiritualizing? Well, it also goes back to energy. Now. You know, we we are so complex, and we're not generally trained. We're given a set of beliefs as we grow up. Well, however we grow up, we're programmed somehow. Mm. But and and that can stop a growing mind, an inquisitive mind. Um, when I look at, you know, when I again, from for, for me, what has been wonderful is well, there's two things. Well, first of all, I didn't have a lot of programming about uh, parapsychology, metaphysics, um, the ET phenomenon at all. Um, But, you know, it's really not such a big question. What feels good? What feels bad? You know, you you start to get in touch with yourself uh, as to, um, you get a sense. Now, I would never have chosen consciously to have ET contact. It It was too terrifying. Uh, much of it I have I interpreted for years and years as a negative experience, and quite frankly, although ultimately I worked with it and it expanded my view of reality, I used it. You take anything that comes your way, however you label it, good, bad, in the gray, whatever it is, you take it and you make a decision that you're going to use it for your good, no matter what it is. There's always something to be derived. And so I've been able to pull that out. No matter what happens, where's the good in this? How can I use this for good? It's how we respond to it, it which is vitally important. Not so much what happens, but how we respond to it. Um, now, truly, I would have preferred not to have the ET contact thing, but that was part of my that was part of my experience. It is what it is. So I worked with it. I will tell you that now if we go into the paranormal realm, realm and more generalized realm, I have had absolutely phenomenal, beautiful, incredible, transforming spiritual experiences as a result of meditation, different life events. So amazing things have happened in the paranormal world for me that I chose to interpret spiritually that affected me on a spiritual level again expanding my sense of reality and consciousness uh, I know we're operating on various planes at the same time I've had amazing things happen absolutely amazing um, I even I've had precognitive dreams where um, I was able to save a woman's life in one experience and um, uh, I was w- working for a law firm in uh, Century City, California. Had a dream on a Thursday night, and um, about finding a woman on the freeway and watching her cross the freeway, and she get hit by a car and she's literally beheaded. It was a horrifying dream. The next day, leaving work, I always had a very specific route that I took, all the time, 100 percent of the time, and it never involved getting on the freeway. I was always driving a service drive. I got off on the service drive completely unexpectedly. It was probably about 5.30. Didn't know why I was doing. 
and I pull into it and there is that same woman from the dream and she is standing stranded um, in the center between the two uh, opposing lanes same woman blonde hair short curly hair standing there I was stunned and I was able to through the grace of spirit I was able to get my car over into the middle lane. What had happened to her is her car had apparently stalled, and she had in her mind she was going to walk across that freeway. Well, I was able to get across and Mm -hmm. pulled over and hollered at her and able to get her in my car. She didn't speak a word of English, but was able to get her off to safety. So a lot of amazing, amazing things have happened to me in the paranormal realm. Really? All right. Well, what um, regarding spirituality, because that's something I wanted to get into in our last few minutes here, our point of view tends to be that a lot of the spirituality maybe that we grew up with or that is around, even in the New Age realm today, is destructive because it concentrates on the self. And uh, the multiverse, as it were, is full of paradoxes. One of them is you find yourself by forgetting yourself. You accept yourself and then you forget. Uh, whereas a lot of the spirituality, it's all me, 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 rather than us, you know, so to speak. Can you speak a little bit about that in, in your experience, in your opinion? Uh, and does spirituality bring us inward or expand us outward or, or both or, or what? Well, spirituality to me, studying that aspect of that, that dimension of, of humanity expands outward to me now does it help me connect and understand who i am it does initially but ultimately what it does it makes me understand that i'm connected to everything Mm -hmm. every action that i take affects another living being affects the planet affects the energy of the planet there's nothing i can do that is singular that is separate from i've been very very involved in service work my entire adult life whether it's with, I mean, it's been with such a variety. I mean, uh, I've had animal rescues. Um, I've worked individual with teenagers coming out of uh, uh, recovery facilities. I've done all kinds of work throughout the years. I've, I spent five or six years literally down on Skid Row in Los Angeles uh, working with homeless people. So ultimately... It's, you know, yes, I think you take your, as you look at the spiritual aspect of your own self, it's important, you must explore, but but that ultimately will lead you into a greater connection with all, with everything. And you begin to see the interconnectedness, the wholeness of the system. It's a beautiful system. And that none of us really are an island. We cannot do anything without impacting someone else. Mm. So um, I agree with that. Um, there are certain uh, religious philosophies that, you know, do not promote a positive, uh, you know, rapport with the world, mm. and they're very self-centered. But that's not the position that I take. I think ultimately, it opens the door. You start with self, you open the door, and then you see. The beautiful, incredible connectedness. You you describe almost the uh, the African concept of Ubuntu. You know the African notion of justice and and living in the world and being and and being far more than yourselves. So something we we tend to uh, to really agree with. Now before we burn up the rest of the time here, Nadine, tell us about your website, your books, where people can find out more about you. Uh, my website is alienexperiences.com. I have another website because I'm working on some new material. It is not in this arena. Um, and that's hbpublishing.net. And there I have a variety of other works going on. Um, I have three books out there now, a fourth one coming out. The first book was Alien Experiences, 25 Cases of Close Encounter. Um, the current one is Evolution, um, Coming to Terms with the ET Presence. And, of course, I did a children's book. Mm-hmm. Uh, finding happiness. They're all on. They're all on uh, Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh, audio, ebook, paperback. Uh, the next work coming out is going to involve more of a what we're talking about, more of a paranormal slant, spiritual slant. Good, good. Keep us posted on that. Yeah, for sure. I and do uh, that. Ben had a uh, 
further thought? I do. Uh, and I, I kind of wanted to bring this up. I've, I've sort of figured out the formula of our show after all these years that we tend to kind of like do all the, all the heavy stuff towards the end unintentionally. <laughs> so here's a very heavy question to end the note on. Um, so last week we had a really fascinating show with Nigel Watson. We talked about the history of UFOs. And there was, all, there was this running theme that kind of went through sort of how we viewed the phenomena over time. And it had to do with technology and spirituality, or, or sort of like ha- how, how one kind of deals with what we're experiencing through, you know, whatever we've sort of experienced. Because, you know, we don't, we don't experience what we don't experience. So in, in, this, in this sort of realm, how do technology and spirituality fit into this equation with E.T.? Are, are they we, – we hear sort of new agey things where they're, oh, well, they're very spiritual beings, and then we still have the nuts and bolts people that say, oh, well, it's all, it's all technology. Is there a place that they meet? In my experience, those entities that I've connected with have not been particularly um, – that I could tell. doesn't say it doesn't exist, but I have not noted any – overt spiritual connection where a lot of people talk about Nordics they talk about you know species that seem more similar to our species and they talk about spiritual experiences that's not been my experience hmm. that's actually mine has yeah that has not been my experience mine has been more um, genetic focused scientific focused technology focused with the um, ETs that I encountered except for one species when I was a, a child. Other than that, most of it has been um, not really of an emotional or spiritual sense particularly emanating from them. Not to say that it doesn't exist, but certainly that it didn't feel, I couldn't feel a sense of it during experiences. We contend that the equation of technology with quote-unquote advancement is a serious mistake. <clears throat> For example, from our own historical historical experience, what was the most advanced nation technologically in the 1930s? It was Nazi Germany. I mean, how did that work out? So I think that I would much rather be in contact with a species that, that is advanced morally and spiritually than with Absolutely. something that's a lot of gadgets. So that, that mm-hmm. we we tend to uh, to call out anyone who talks about advancement in that sense. Uh, we only have a few minutes left, but the disclosure. Our personal opinion is that it is naive to think anything that comes out of the government, is, any government, is going to be complete or accurate or true uh, in, in any real sense because there's always an agenda. And with our particular government, you know, with all the greatest respect uh, to our country, I'm a veteran, Certainly, and uh, it's that there are many, many competing agencies. Uh, some have information. They, a lot of them don't, don't talk to each other, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What say you are the notion of disclosure? Is it naive or is it going to happen? <laughs> I'm on the same page as you are, okay? Mm. I, I, the only disclosure that's going to happen is from the, the people that are connected to it, experiencing it, and talk about it. Do I think it's going to come from agencies, governments? Absolutely not. I, I I don't. I think it is naive. I don't think it's going to happen. I don't see it happening. I don't put any. I don't put any energy into that. Um, I, I share my experience, strength and hope, if you will, uh, and that's disclosure. I am disclosure. Mm. You mm-hmm. disclosure. As individuals, we are disclosure. We're looking for something big, organized from government. It's not going to happen. It can't. There's too many. There's too many, uh, you know, complex agendas going on. I don't see that ever happening. So I, I agree with you. Okay. Uh, there is the, uh, the uh, one final thought. Uh, one of the subtitles of your books, and this will lead into another show, which will not take place in 2031. It'll be, uh, <laughs> Put it on your calendar. Um, yeah, the subtitle refers to the ET presence. What exactly do you mean by that? I mean, can you wave to them at the market, or I mean, what? What, uh, what do you mean by the ET presence uh, specifically? The ET presence on our planet in our lives, whether they be walking amongst us, whether they be uh, interdimensional experiences, whether they be physical experiences coming to the planet and leaving, the presence itself of what it is, 
um, coming to terms with, for me, is acknowledging that it exists. Not necessarily defining specifically what it is, but acknowledging that it's taking place. Uh, extraterrestrial doesn't necessarily have to mean an alien on another planet. It could mean anything non-human entity that comes from the third dimension. Mm. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, Ben, any uh, final thoughts here? Um, no, that's actually really interesting because I've I often say the same thing. I think I think the terms that we have just aren't good enough, and mm-hmm. I, I I think how how we we sort of talk about this phenomena kind of, uh, in in general, right? Not just ET or or the paranormal. You know, one of the major issues is language. You know, and and in any sort of debate or understanding of anything, you know, you have to define your terms. And there's so many conflicting terms, and so so many sort of ways that people are saying the same things, but you know, just with different words, that it, it's getting very confusing. <laughs> I think it's sort of exactly. unif- a unified vocabulary, just to be able to begin to describe the indescribable is, I think, so sort of square one that we haven't even gotten to yet. Well, that's it. Well, we're pretty much out of time. Uh, Nadine, we'll be in touch off the air because we want to send you some books. And uh, thank you again. Inspiring conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ben and Paul. It was um, a pleasure. I Very appreciate good. it. Okay. All right, folks, let's get to our announcements <clears throat> here. We didn't have time to get to everything we wanted to with, with uh, Nadine, but we'll, we'll have her back soon. Uh, As we've been announcing on recent shows, the 2020 Exeter UFO Festival on Labor Day weekend has been canceled, unfortunately, but the 55th anniversary of the incident at Exeter will not go unsung on our show. On September 6th, uh, the day we would have broadcast from the Exeter uh, Town Hall with a panel of the speakers from the festival in a live audience for the fifth year in a row, we will offer a rebroadcast of last year's panel show from there, and on the panel were Kathleen Martin, Peter Robbins, Mac Maloney, Mac, Mike Stevens, and many other folks you know from uh, this show. Uh, and um, there you go. And ben, if you want, I don't know if you want to take the next. Oh yeah, sure. Uh, you know, you know me, pressing buttons and stuff. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so the following week, September thirteenth, will bring you a very special guest: retired FBI agent Clint Rand, or Clinton Rand. Sorry, I was thinking Clint Eastwood for whatever reason, but Clinton <laughs> Rand, uh, who uh, as a ham is a Hampton, New Hampshire uh, police sergeant in September 1965, was on duty at the police station, uh, well, at the police department desk, during the incident at Exeter, which involved UFO encounters by several of his officers. And on the uh, (coughs) day, excuse me, on the day after what would have been the Exeter UFO Festival, September 7th, Labor Day in the U.S., Ben and I will be on the Travel Channel as part of the debut of The Devil's Road, the true story of N. Lorraine Warren, the first in a new series of two-hour documentaries they're doing, America's True Horror Stories. Uh, anyway, I'm in it as someone who worked with the Warrens, and Ben is there to represent the, the next generation of researchers, and that will be on the Travel Channel, 9 p.m. Eastern, Monday, September 7th, 2020. So we have high hopes uh, that we can be back at the Greater New England UFO Conference in Lemonster, Massachusetts. That's on Columbus Day weekend. Uh, my dad is scheduled to be the keynote speaker to mark his 50-year work anniversary in paranormal research. A little round of applause from me over here. And uh, there are plans for an online conference if it cannot be held uh, in the usual physical venue. Uh, and you can look for Shane there as well. Okay, yeah, Shane Sirway. Uh We're looking forward in October to the... Um, Western Connecticut UFO Conference. Also, I uh, talked to the organizer yesterday, and we've got uh, April 10th and 11th, 2021, Kittery, Maine. The New England Parafest will be back, and uh, we'll be telling you all about that. So we'll kind of run it out of the wire here. What do we have next week, Ben? So next week uh, we have, that's on August 9th. Wow, we're already in August. Uh, my dad and I will do something we haven't done in a long time, and that's take an hour to ourselves to bring you on a journey into something uh, we're especially interested in. Uh, in this case, it is, what is eternal life? Bigger question than a lot of people might realize. Hey, you know, so, it's the, the, the yeah. shorter the sentence, the longer the explanation. That's <laughs> right. So we'll uh, leave you today with a concise line from the American poet John Greenleaf Whittier, 19th century. Uh, in the field of destiny, we reap what we have sown. All right, so I'm Paul Eno. And I'm Ben Eno, and thanks for joining us on our great cosmic journey, and we shall see you next time on Behind the Paranormal. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of 
Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.